Next, our next speaker is Patrick Caridito, uh, who is a professor of mathematics at ETH Zurich and director of the Risk Lab there and a member of the ETH AI Center. He also serves on the board of the Swiss Association of Actuaries. His research interests are in stochastic modeling, mathematical finance, quantitative risk management, and insurance mathematics. He is an associate editor for the SIAM Journal on Financial Mathematics, Mathematical Finance, the European Actuarial Journal, and the Journal of Risk. And today he's going to be speaking to us about assessing asset liability risk and the numerical approximation of conditional expectations. Thanks very much, Patrick, whenever you're ready. Thanks so much. And also thanks for organizing the event and having me as a speaker uh, virtually in Canada. Uh, so this is about uh, assessing asset liability risk. And then in a second part, I will also talk about the approximation of conditional expectation. Um, so as we all know, machine learning has produced remarkable results in uh, uh, image classification, speech recognition, machine translation, and uh, games like chess, go, and also video games. And I guess large part of the appeal of uh, some of the machine learning methods is that they can be applied directly to data and uh, figure out patterns by themselves. Um, but on the other hand, it can also be used as a numerical method to solve uh, mathematical problems. Um, for example, partial differential equations like uh, classical linear pricing equations or more recently, um, people have been inter in, uh, interested in nonlinear uh, variants, uh, including default risk, transaction costs, different rates for borrowing and lending, and so on. Um, can also be used uh, uh, for control problems, like uh, they appear in uh, financial applications, uh, for example, in the form of optimal investment, hedging, optimal trade execution, market making. Uh, and, and today I will talk about uh, uh, risk assessment problems. Um, and so banks and insurance companies still uh, uh, use models. Um, this, of course, can lead to model risk, uh, which is the risk that your model doesn't uh, exactly re reflect what is going on in the real world. Um, but then on the other hand, I mean, in certain parts of the bank and, and an insurance company, for example, uh, people have to explain to their customers what they're doing. They also have to communicate with regulators. And, and if they have models, at least they have some kind of a language to, to explain what they're doing. Um, uh, possibly you could also study conversions rates. Um, or, or you could, could think about uh, coming up with guarantees how well you're solving your model. Okay, and so we are going to discuss about some of these questions in, in, in the framework of the following problem. So um, um, in many situations, um, a bank or an insurance company is concerned about their risk over a particular uh, uh, risk horizon. Um, for a bank, this might be two weeks, for example, uh, for uh, insurance companies in Europe, which are uh, subject to uh, the Solvency II regulations, it's typically one year. Um, so this tau here is uh, the risk horizon. And so we think of it as, uh, as being one year, for example. But then a life insurance company has contracts that are much longer than, than one year. So they, they might have contracts which last for 20, 30 or 40 years. So they somehow have to project back their longer term risk to the risk horizon. Um, so for what we're doing here is we're, we, for, we're assuming that all relevant information at the risk horizon is given by a random vector X with uh, components X1 to XD. And then we are assuming we having a, a portfolio whose value capital v, v is given by some component that is uh, measurable with respect to the information that I have at uh, the risk horizon. And then another component, which is coming from uh, longer term contracts. And I'm assuming here I have some cash flow CTI that I have down here uh, that are occurring after the risk horizon. And I'm going to value them by discounting them with some numerator process. 
and I'm going to sum them up and I'm, I'm calculating conditional expectation under some pricing measure Q. Okay, so then this is my value at, uh, it's, it's an X measurable random variable, uh, which is the value of the portfolio at time tau, which is the risk horizon. Okay, and since we are, let's say we are uh, the risk manager of an insurance company, we're, in, we're interested in, in the risk of a loss. So we're just switching the sign here and I'm going to denote, denote by L the negative of V, which I can write as the conditional expectation of Y given X, where Y is now just the, neg the, the, the negative of, of what I have up here. Okay. Um, and then in the end, uh, so in Europe, the regulator asks uh, for a value at risk number, typically at the level 99.5%. And in Switzerland, actually, they're asking for an expected shortfall, uh, typically at the, at the 99% level. Okay, and then just to um, be precisely clear what we're talking about. So the value at risk is defined as the left quantile of the loss distribution at the level alpha here. And uh, under the expected shortfall, I understand this thing here, which people also call an average value at risk, which is just the uh, average of value at risks at levels ranging between alpha and one. And uh, this is almost the same as the conditional expectation of L given that L is exceeding the quantile at the level alpha. But then if you have discrete distributions, it's, uh, it's not always exactly the same. So what we mean by expected shortfall is this integral expression here. Okay. Um, and then the next thing uh, that we're using is that we can uh, write conditional expectations as minimizing functions. Okay, and before I'm doing this, I have to paste together the real world measure with the pricing measure, because from time zero, up to the risk horizon tau, we will be interested in the evolution of the world under the, the real world probability measure P. And then since we are pricing after that, we, after that we're interested in the Q dynamics of things. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm pasting together P and Q like this. Um, so until tau, the risk horizon, I'm using the distribution pi of the random vector X. And then from that point on, I'm using Q to determine my transition probabilities from there on. And this uh, is giving me this glued measure here that I denote by P uh, cross Q. Okay. And then what my, my goal now is, is to calculate the conditional expectation of this random variable Y given the random vector X under this glued measure P times Q, okay? And so as we all know, the, the conditional expectation can be understood as an L2 projection of a random variable Y to the set of all uh, random variables that are measurable with respect to X, okay? And so I've drawn a little picture here. So what you try to do geometrically is you try to project this Y down uh, to this blue set here. Okay, and, and mathematically what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve uh, a minimization problem, which is you try to find a Borel measurable function F from RD into R, which is minimizing this uh, square objective function here. Okay. Um, so now in most cases, uh, you will not be able to calculate this explicitly. And, and then a widely used approach is a standard least uh, uh, squares Monte Carlo, in which you simulate from these distributions pairs of X and Y. And then you try to find a, a function F that is minimizing this Monte Carlo approximation to your expectation up here. Okay. And then traditionally what people have done is uh, they have used linear regression to solve this problem, in which case you would just, you would not solve this minimization over all possible Borean measurable functions F, but you would restrict yourself to linear combinations of these uh, um, components X1 to XD, or you could do a polynomial uh, regression here, in which case you would, uh, uh, choose polynomials in the components of X as basis functions. And, and then typically you do it for 
or the two, because if you have, I don't know, already 10, 50, 100 dimensions, moving to all polynomials of order three will be too many. Okay, uh, but then if you do that, um, what will happen, and I, I tried to depict it here in this, in this picture here is typically, since with your basis functions that you're using to do your least square Monte Carlo, you're not spanning the whole blue set here, right? So if you numerically comp compute the minimizer of this, uh, of this minimization problem here, your solution will be somewhere in this blue set here, right? And if uh, you're using linear regression or polynomial uh, regression, you might be quite far inside this blue set. Um, Okay, so the idea then is uh, to use uh, um, neural networks instead of, uh, okay, and I should have mentioned that this has been used in quantity finance by Longstoff Schwartz in the context of uh, evaluation of American options by simulation. So there they propose polynomial regression. And recently it has been used in a paper by Ha and Bauer uh, to solve exactly the problem that we're solving here, namely the assessment of uh, portfolio risk. Okay, and so the idea here now is uh, um, instead of using linear or polynomial regression to use a, a set of neural networks and solve this uh, minimization problem over, over the neural networks. Okay, and then so I'm sure everybody already knows, but so a, a typical feed forward neural network uh, looks somewhat like this. Um, so it's a composition of, uh, of uh, affine functions and nonlinear functions. And in theory, you can have as many hidden layers as you want, but, uh, but here I depicted two. And that's also what I will be using later when we do, uh, when we try to solve uh, examples. Um, Q1 and Q2 here are uh, positive integers specifying the numbers of, of uh, nodes I have in the two hidden layers here. And uh, um, these little a1, a2 to a3 are affine uh, transformations that you can represent with matrices capital AI and, and vectors BI. And rho is uh, some nonlinear activation function, which typically is, or in many applications, is the hyperbolic tangent or, or also the ReLU function, but here we will use the hyperbolic tangent uh, component-wise. Uh, so if you build uh, a neural network with uh, two hidden layers, then, then this is the number of, uh, of parameters you will have. So the parameters will consist of all the components you have in the matrices capital AI up here and the vectors BI. So this is the pre precise numbers of uh, parameters that you will have in your, your neural network. So if you have an input dimension of D and you choose like uh, uh, roughly the same number of neural net uh, nodes in the hidden layers, uh, then since you have matrices here, you have an order of D squared uh, parameters in your, in your neural network. Okay. Um, so if you trained your uh, neural network, uh, what you, and then you wanna calculate uh, estimates of value at risk or expected shortfall. So the most, most uh, straightforward thing would be uh, to simulate. Uh, independent copies of, uh, of X. Um, and then apply the neural network that you have trained to approximate uh, the loss uh, to these simulated uh, X vectors and order them according to the, the losses they, they generate. Okay, and then uh, you have an empirical uh, measure for uh, the losses that you observe. And then you just apply the left quantile and the expected shortfall to this empirical measure. And what this uh, gives you is that the estimate of the value at risk will just be the chase worth worst loss uh, for your simulated data, where J is, uh, 
roughly uh, such that j over the, the whole number of, uh, of samples is, is equal to the fraction one minus alpha. And your estimate of the expected shortfall is basically the average over, over the, the j worst uh, uh, losses, okay? And, uh, and there also exist convergence rates uh, uh, that tell you that these estimates actually converge to the, to the correct value at risk and expected shortfall if you increase the number of simulations anyway. Um, okay, uh, so the next observation is that uh, um, since we are typically interested, say, in a 99.5% value at risk or, or a 99% uh, uh, expected shortfall, it's maybe not the best idea to, uh, to simulate from the given distribution, uh, but it's better to distort the distribution a bit. And so the first thing that you notice then is um, the, the conditional expectation uh, really doesn't depend on the measure that you're using to, to model the evolution of the world from, from time zero to the, to the uh, uh, risk horizon, uh, which I had denoted by P, but this one can be distorted. Uh, the conditional expectation only depends on the Q measure that you're using to model the, uh, the evolution after, after the, the risk horizon. Okay, so a little lemma that you easily show is that uh, if you just distort the distribution of X to any equivalent distribution nu, uh, and then you solve this uh, square minimization problem under this new distorted measure, it will give you the same solution. I mean, it will give you the same optimal function F, okay? And why is that? Because you can solve this minimization problem up here uh, pointwise if you condition on X. Okay, and then if, if you do this, what you see is you just see the, the, the transition probabilities coming from Q that you use to model your evolution after the risk horizon. Okay. Um, so the idea then would be, since we allow to distort the distribution of a P in the first step that we're taking from time zero until the risk horizon, uh, to sample more frequently from the tail when estimating value at risk and expected short form. And so just to give you a rough idea how you, how you can do that. So we assume that L is, our loss is some function of X that we don't know, so we approximate it. Um, and then X in many applications is just some linear transformation A of some standard normal vector C and then some transformation U of that, okay? And so the idea is to choose a vector V whose ith component is one. So this is a very simple idea, but as you will see, it works pretty well. Um, if F composed with U is increasing uh, in YI, and again, you don't know F, but from the problem, you will often know whether, uh, F is increasing or decreasing in this direction. And you choose VI to be minus one if, if this composition is decreasing. Okay, so once you have this vector F, then you just tilt the distribution of your underlying normal random vector in the direction of VTA. And I just drawn a little picture here. So this is like the level lines of the original uh, distribution of the random vector C say in two dimensions. And all you do is you shift this whole distribution in the direction of VTA. And this is the direction where uh, uh, the, the worst losses happen in your model. Okay, and once you have tilted your distribution, uh, then you assume G was the original density of, of C and G had this the tilted uh, density. And now you sample from the tilted uh, distribution. Um, and then you also use samples from this distribution to train your neural network. So you approximate the, the loss. Uh, and then you sample again from the tilted distribution. And now you, reor you reorder your uh, uh, empirical losses that you ob obtain. 
and you introduce uh, these weights, okay, which kind of correct for the fact that you have uh, now sampled more frequently from the tail. Uh, and now the new, your new or uh, important sampling estimate of value at risk will be this uh, L wiggle J, where J is now defined by this expression here. So it's the minimum I uh, such that if you add the weights from one to I, you exceed the fraction one minus alpha. And similarly, your estimate for uh, expected shortfall using this important sampling distribution is this expression over here. And again, basically it's this first sum here and this second term is just here to correct for the fact that you're using this new definition of, of expected shortfall. Okay, so how does it all work? Um, so here uh, we start with a simple example. Uh, so what we're doing is we uh, forming a portfolio of call and put options. So I have some underlying assets, which all follow uh, geometric Brownian motions with different drift and, and volatility parameters, maybe under the P measure. And under the Q measure, they all have drift R where R is the risk-free interest rate. Okay, and I also might have, I also might have uh, correlation between the Brownian motions. Also, I have to say, this is like our first um, model. The, the advantage of the approach is that I don't have to choose geometric Brownian motions here. I just need something from which I can simulate. Um, uh, then the loss, say I sold these options. So I'm exposed uh, to them and, and, and I wanna, and say they have a maturity which is longer than my risk horizon and I wanna calculate the risk at the risk horizon. Uh, what I have to do is now I have to calculate conditional expectation under the pricing measure of the sum of the payoffs of the call options which, which is the first sum here and the sum of the payoffs of the put options which is the second sum conditioned on X where X now is just uh, the vector of asset prices at the, at the risk horizon. Okay, um, so why am I choosing this problem to solve first? Because I can calculate these, uh, these conditional expectation explicitly just by using, because these options here decompose and then I'm just using Black-Scholes individually on all of these call and put options. So I have a reference value uh, to compare how, how well my numerical method works. Here. And so um, I'm calculating value at risk um, in the left picture, the green, the green line is the true value which I obtain by, by using the Black-Scholes formula. Um, the orange line is uh, obtained by using this uh, empirical value at risk by just simulating from the original distribution. And you see it kind of converges. I mean, the scale is fine here, so it's not too far off from the from the true value. I don't know how well you see it on your on your screen. And the blue line is with important sampling. Okay, so what you see is the blue line converges much faster than the orange orange line, and and both of them are not too far away from from the true value, which is the green line. Okay, on the right picture, we do the same thing for the expected shortfall. Again, we can calculate the true value here in this example. The orange line is like wiggling around a bit, but it then is converging to some kind of a value, uh, which is not too far away. And the blue line is converging much faster. So you need much less simulations uh, to, um, to determine value at risk or expected shortfall. Okay. Um, then let's move to a bit the more complicated example, which is a variable annuity with uh, uh, added benefits. So here it's a guaranteed minimum income benefit. Um, so what's this variable annuity? Well, there is a, a maturity T and then at time T, there is an index ST, which I write as an exponential of some of the log of the index QT, because I'm going to model the log. And then at maturity, this person who bought this variable annuity can decide whether they want to take the index or they want to have uh, an annuity, which pays a certain amount of money. 
um, each year after maturity. And X is just denoting the age of this person. Okay, so X will basically model how long how long this person will live because the annuity is paid until as long as the uh, the person lives. Okay, and uh, so. To calculate, uh, say the maturity is, I don't know, 20 years or something, um, but you have to calculate this, the worth, the value of this liability in one year from now. So again, you have to project this expression. You are, we are also discounting here with the stochastic interest rate R. Um, and then we are also discounting with um, um, uh, the mortality rate mu. Okay, because the, 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 the annuity is only, is only running as long as the person lives. And then we're going to max EQT and, uh, and uh, the value of the, of the annuity at time capital T. Okay, so this is a, quite a complicated product. Um, and so again, Q is just a log index, RT is a stochastic interest rate, and, and mu is a, is a stochastic mortality rate. And I'm sparing you the details how exactly we, we modeled those. So again, we just used standard models. So it was just, uh, the index was a geometric brown in motion. The interest rate was something mean reverting, Ornstein, Uhlenbeck, or Cox, Ingers, and Ross, I don't remember exactly. And mu was also some kind of a standard dynamics. Um, okay, and then uh, let's see how this works. So again, uh, so without important sampling, the estimate of the value at risk uh, uh, wiggles around a bit in the number of simulations you, you perform and then converges in the long run to some value. With important sampling, it converges much faster. And uh, the reference value here is from a paper uh, this paper by Ha and Bauer that I already mentioned, where they do uh, polynomial regression with a lot of polynomials and uh, several million simulations to solve this problem. Okay. They only do the value at risk in this paper. So here we also calculate the expected shortfall. Um, so again, we have the orange line for doing this without important sampling and uh, the blue line for doing this with important sampling. With important sampling, this converges much faster than without, and they roughly converge to the same value. Um, the only thing is here, we don't have a reference value. Uh, so now the question is, what are these estimates worth? Um, so problem one is somehow these estimates always converge, but they, in a sense, converge to the wrong values, right? Because in the first step, you trained your neural network to approximate the, the true loss, and you will always have an approximation error there, right? So what you, what you really converge to is uh, to the model as if it was given by your neural network approximation and, and not to, to the true model value. So the question is, but then over here in the value at risk case, we see that uh, the values that you converge to are kind of close to the true value. But here we don't really know. And, and this is due to the fact that uh, all these uh, often mentioned black box problem of, uh, of neural networks or, or more widely machine learning methods. The, mach the, the, the neural network is giving us some answer, but in, in we don't really know how how good it is. Um, so what do we do if we don't have reference values for this for this problem? So what do we tell the regulator <laughs> what our risk is? Uh, okay, and so to talk a bit about this, I, I want to come back to this uh, projection problem. Um, and so this uh, projection problem is. Uh, convex minimization problem, okay? So it's complicated. So in full generality, it's infinite dimensional because I'm optimizing or minimizing overall Borel measurable functions F here, uh, but it has a dual formulation, okay? And, and the dual formulation can be written as this formula here, if you like, but maybe it's easier to understand if you look at this picture here, right? So the minimization problem is to find 
a point in this picture up here in the blue set, which is closest to Y. Uh, the dual problem would be to find the separating hyperplane, which separates Y from the blue set, but whose distance is uh, maximal to Y. Okay. And so the red one, the red uh, hyperplane here would be one possible candidate. Uh, the distance to Y would be this dotted red line here. So it's not uh, maximal. So the maximal uh, separating hyperplane would be the green one here, okay? Because the distance between this one and Y is exactly this, uh, the distance between Y and the conditional expectation. Okay, so that's, uh, these are nice pictures. <laughs> the problem is the, the, the dual problem is, uh, is a maximization problem. And the constraints that you have here is that uh, what you try to find is a, a square integrable random variable uh, Z whose conditional expectation given X is zero. So these are infinitely many linear constraints. Okay, but then again, you can try to solve this problem numerically. And for any valid candidates that you come up with, with which for the primal problem is some Borean measurable function from RD to R. And for the dual problem would be some random variable whose conditional expectation given X is zero. You have a bound for the, for the L2 distance between Y and its conditional expectation. The upper bound is uh, uh, the L2 distance between Y and your candidate conditional expectation F hat. And the lower bound is uh, this expression here. Okay, and then since y minus is conditional expectation and the conditional expectation minus the candidate conditional expectation are orthogonal, uh, you obtain from, from Pythagoras theorem uh, this inequality here, okay? So the, the distance from the true conditional expectation to your guess of the conditional expectation is this expression. Uh, but since you have a lower bound on this part here, you can upper bound it by this expression over here. And good thing is uh, you can estimate this right hand side with uh, Monte Carlo. So you can estimate an upper bound for the error you're making when you approximate, approximate in your conditional expectation in L2. Um, Okay, let's see again, uh, let's uh, go through some examples to, to see how this works. So the first example is, is again an example that I can solve explicitly just to, to, to be able to benchmark the method. Um, so here uh, I choose X1 to X4 IID standard normal. And I build Y by uh, this polynomial expression, X1 plus X2 squared plus X2 X4 plus some noise V, which is also independent standard normal. Okay. Uh, so of course I directly know that the conditional expectation of Y given X is just this expression in, in X1 to X4 and this V just uh, goes away. Okay, but now let's assume we didn't know that and we train the neural network to approximate the conditional expectation. We also tried to find an estimate for the lower bound. And we use this formula that I showed you before to estimate uh, the L2 error I'm committing by approximating the true expect, conditional expectation with, with this candidate here. And, uh, and I'm also normalizing this by uh, the two norm of the true conditional expectation. And um, since I have some time left, let's maybe have a closer look at these numbers here. Um, so I also should say that what I have in the first column is my point estimate, okay? so when I'm estimating this, I'm using Monte Carlo. So, so the outcome will, will be random, but I'm using a lot of uh, 
samples to build my Monte Carlo average in the order of millions, uh, because it's quite cheap for me to, to simulate from the model. And, uh, and what I have on the left side here is the point estimate of this uh, L2 distance uh, of, the, of the candidate conditional expectation from the true conditional expectation, normalized by the true conditional expectation. And what I have on the left side is, uh, is a 95% confidence upper bound on this quantity, okay? Because I will have some Monte Carlo noise when, I, when I'm estimating the left side here but I can't quantify the, the, the variation that I have in my Monte Carlo estimation. And what I have here is a 95% uh, confidence upper bound on this quantity. Um, okay, now let's look at, uh, at the results. Um, so the first method I'm using is I'm using a, a, just a classical linear regression which means I try to approximate the conditional expectation of y given x just by linear combinations of x1, x2, x3, x4. And, and that's not going to work very well, right? Because the true answer is this uh, polynomial expression in the components of x. So I will have a relative error of uh, roughly 77% and, and uh, the 95% the, the confidence up the bound is of the same order. Okay, in a next step, I'm, I'm uh, using a polynomial regression of order two, meaning I'm projecting, I'm, I'm trying to approximate this conditional expectation with polynomials of uh, second order. And so this expression is of course uh, covered by, uh, by polynomials of second order. Um, so it should work well, and it does, right? So the, the relative approximation error is uh, just 0.1%. Uh, the confidence, 95% confidence up the bound is a bit larger. And then we're trying to use, uh, we're using two uh, neural networks, one with a ReLU activation function, which is just a positive part, which I'm sure all of you know. And so it works well. It's so the, the, the error is the relative error is 0.5%. It's a bit worse than the, the polynomial regression, but that, that's that's natural in this example because the polynomial regression gives kind of the, almost the true answer. 95% uh, confidence up bound is, is a bit higher again. And then we do the same exercise for neural network with hyperbolic tangent activation function. And uh, the, these are the numbers, so they're equally good, uh, a bit different. Okay. Um, now, uh, we want to make our love life more complicated. And so this is like a purely artificial uh, function that we just invented. So it's meant to be non-linear and non-polynomial and, and a, a bit complicated. Um, so here I have uh, five IID standard normals X1 to X5 and another five IID standard normals V1 to V5. And I'm defining Y to be this complicated function of the X1 to X5 and V1 to, to V5. Okay, so now I guess it's more difficult to guess what the conditional expectation is. And in fact, it's not possible, I assume, I mean, I don't know for sure, but to come up with the explicit solution for the conditional expectation of Y given X now, right? So X is in here, but it, additionally you have these Vs here. And so basically for any given X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, you try to average over the Vs, but the Vs are inside this log and hyperbolic tangent functions. So that's not an easy problem. Okay, so let's try to use neural networks to approximate the conditional expectation. Sorry, let's uh, go through the same steps. So first we use a linear regression, okay, where we project down this function here, just do linear combinations of x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and uh, relative error is 100%. Okay, and, uh, the 95% confidence up the bound is of, of the same order. Uh, then let's do a polynomial regression, and again, it's of uh, uh, second order. So it's uh, linear terms and second order terms 
which means square terms in x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x and, and also mixed terms. Uh, now it doesn't work so well anymore, right? Because uh, the function up here clearly is not uh, polynomial. So the error is, the relative error is 30% now and the confidence up bound is of the same order. And now the neural networks really are much better than linear regression and polynomial regression. So it's almost as good as before. I mean, I have to say that you have to choose your neural networks large enough here so that they, they have the expressivity to, to actually approximate uh, the conditional expectation in this, uh, in this example. And you have to train it carefully to obtain these results. But if you do that, you can obtain quite good results. So you get the point estimates of the relative error, which is on the 1%. And uh, confidence bounds, which are just uh, a little above uh, above one percent. Okay, uh, and then let's uh, do a financial example. Um, so here I'm modeling uh, a hundred-dimensional so-called max max call option. And so for simplicity, I'm just uh, modeling everything under the risk neutral dynamics. So the drift is immediately R here, so that I, don't, I don't have to go through this business of uh, having different drifts. Uh, but I can still have different volatilities here, sigma i. And I'm assuming I have a hundred different assets here. And uh, I'm interested in a so-called max call option, which has a maturity capital T, and the payoff is the maximum of uh, over all these underlying assets, minus some strike price uh, K, uh, and then the positive difference of this, if it's positive and zero otherwise, and I'm discounting it by the riskless interest rate, and I'm trying to calculate conditional expectation given the values of these underlying assets, S1 to S100, at some earlier time, uh, little t. And uh, these are the numerical results. Um, so again, what you see, the linear regression and the polynomial regression are, are not so bad here, uh, which we also observe in, in other financial applications. Um, so this function here is, is non-linear. It's a max, you have a positive part, so it has a kink, but then you calculate the conditional expectation. So it smooths out this function a little bit. So it's definitely not as bad as the, the function that I, that I showed you before that we kind of constructed in such a way so that it's uh, really complicated. So the linear and the polynomial regression, if you do it carefully, I mean, actually we do the polynomial regression also second order. And if you have a hundred uh, predictors here, you include all of those, plus you also include all the, the, the second order terms, it gives you about 5,000. So you will have a regression down on 5,000 predictors. So it's computationally still a complicated problem, but if you do it carefully, you, you obtain quite good results. With the neural networks, again, whether it's ReLU or hyperbolic tangent, it doesn't matter so much, you obtain better results. The point estimates are even negative. I mean, even though the, the quantity you try to estimate here clearly cannot be negative, but again, you will have some Monte Carlo noise. So if, 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 you, if you have a neural network that approximates this quantity well, then the true value will be close to zero. And you, if you estimate it with Monte Carlo, it can happen to you that, uh, that what you estimate is negative. But these are estimates of your relative error, which are close to zero. And also the confidence bounds are, are not too far away uh, from zero. And this is it, so I'm afraid I was a bit too quick, but I guess it's uh, um, late on, uh, on Friday afternoon for you guys and evening for me, so nobody's too sad if I, if I stop here. So um, we have one paper which is on this uh, asset liability risk uh, problem with neural networks, which is published. 
And then we have a second paper, which is uh, uh, some uh, theoretical estimates on computation, uh, com computing conditional expectation with guarantees, which is coming up. And then this third paper here is the paper that I mentioned by Ho and Bauer, which does the same uh, uh, portfolio risk assessment problem with uh, polynomial regression. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for, for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions? <coughs> Chat, sorry. Oh, how about I uh, kick? Yeah, we, I see. Off. I see one here. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. Good. Sorry, Sebastian. You, you could, after Jose. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so Jose, please uh, unmute yourself, and you can uh, ask your question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just I want to know uh, what is the ground truth that you are using when when you compute the conditional expectation of the uh, with, with the neural networks. Yeah. Okay. So as I'm not. 100% fluent with uh, the machine learning lingo, I have to say. By so, ground truth, truth. I mean, you, you. I guess you mean the true conditional expectation. Y yes. Uh, so, in in the first example that I've shown you, uh, which I guess is this one. Okay. So we set it up in a way so that we can calculate the conditional expectation explicitly. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's this orange expression here. In the second okay. case, it was more, more kind of uh, nonlinear. And then in the other examples, basically, we cannot calculate the, the you don't know what the true conditional expectations is. is. And, and that's the situation in many applications. OK? Yes. That, yes. So what you try to do in many applications is then you try to, I mean, more generally, in many uh, machine, uh, machine learning applications, you try to minimize some kind of a loss function. Often it's a square function like here, right? Mm -hmm. So you just do your best. <laughs> but in the end, in many applications, you don't really know how good this is. Or uh, I mean, in many applications, I guess you get good results in some sense, but you don't really know how close you are to the true optimum. And so here, what we propose is, uh, we propose to solve this dual problem. Okay, so the dual mm -hmm. problem will also not help you to find the true conditional expectation, but it will give you an estimate how far your candidate conditional expectation is away from the true conditional expectation, even if you even, even if you don't know the true conditional expectation, but this kind of method allows you to get an estimate of how far you're away. Oh, by using the dual formulation, you mean? Yes. I see. Yeah. I see this is kind of, it's similar to control or any optimization problem, right? So if you have a convex minimization or a concave, maximization problem and you solve it numerically, a priori, you don't know how well you solved it. I mean, in many situations, maybe you have convergence rates or something. So you have an idea how much effort you have to put into it to, to come close to a good solution. But in the end, you, you solve it numerically and you don't know how well you solved it. But whenever you have a dual problem, then you kind of approximate it from the other side. And if you know the gap is small between the two, you know the true solution is in between there, then you have a guarantee that you're close to the true solution. All right, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Sebastian? Yeah, I was just wondering in the, you looked at um, expected shortfall and value at risk. And in, I guess, in example one in particular, you were showing that it, uh, it was sort of an under, there was a bias downwards from, the, from, from what was ground truth there, right? Yep. <laughs> and so is it provably downward biased when you use this methodology for your, your tilting methodology? I, I don't think so. Um, um, I mean, 
I think, okay, so here's what I think, but it's all a bit uh, intuitive and I don't have any results, honestly. But uh, I mean, typically, I don't know how no, you know this literature on uh, replicating portfolios and, and also estimating the, the risk of a portfolio like we do it here. Mm -hmm. um, typically you're underestimating the risk uh, because why? Uh, why do I have the picture? Um, so you're trying to solve this projection problem uh, numerically. And so mm -hmm. let me try to find it. Yeah, so uh, somehow you're in the interior rather than on the, on the edge. And so, right? I mean, typically what is happening to you, so you're trying to project this Y down to this blue set, right? But then if you're, say in the extreme case, you're projecting it down to a constant, you're just calculating the expectation of this while you're losing variance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, compared to the true conditional expectation. So, so if I had to guess, like mm -hmm. if I'm going to solve this conditional expectation approximation, like roughly, mm -hmm. I'm going to lose variance. So I'm going to lose risk. So I'm rather going to underestimate the risk. So that's my guess. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's also in a sense what we see here uh, in these numerical results for the estimation of value at risk and expected shortfall here. Right. Uh, in both cases, uh, you're estimating the, the, green the green line a little bit though by very little in this example. Uh, whether you will always find that the orange line, meaning if you calculate this without important sampling will be above the blue line, which is with that, I don't know. So I also don't have a, an explanation for this. Okay, cool. Yeah, are there any uh, other questions? Okay, uh, then we will take a break and the next talk is at 3.30.